on in our first Corinthians uh, book, and we're beginning this month with chapter four. Um, and just as a theme that I saw um, for us, to, you know, for the month as we are in this together. So we'll go ahead and get started. So will um, someone, anyone just volunteer to pray us in. I'll pray. Father God in heaven, we come before your throne of grace. We come humbly acknowledging you as our Lord and Savior. Father God, we come for no other reason, for no show, form, or fashion, but to study your word. Help us to learn all that we can on this day, Father God, so that we can take it and apply it. We love you, we honor you, and we ask that you bless the facilitator, Father God. Give her what she needs to share this message with us. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Cynthia. Mm -hmm. So as we're moving along throughout 1 Corinthians, um, this chapter four is actually the last part of Paul's discussion on division in the church. And so throughout chapters one through, well, one, two, three, and, and now four, um, he's talked about how the Corinthian church had what they've done to be divided and also as a theme is how we can be unified in our service to God. And so this is the last chapter on this particular issue that Paul is addressing in the letter of 1 Corinthians. And as I was saying, you know, as unity being the theme, um, as Paul was describing the different um, ways that they can be unified in their service, he was emphasized, he emphasized this. Um, and then, like I said, this section about the church division ends in chapter four. Um, with what we're talking about, the role of church leaders, the role of church leaders. So I just have a few points just to bring out in this particular chapter, and then we'll just go through them and um, discuss and ask questions, and we'll just um, go from there. So we'll get started. So will somebody read verses uh, one through five of chapter four? I'll do it. Okay, one through five, you said, Kelly? Yes, mm -hmm. chapter okay. four. Apostles of Christ. You should think of us as Christ's servants who have been put in charge of God's secret truths. The one thing required of such servants is that they be faithful to their master. Now, I am not all concerned. I am not at all concerned about being judged by you or by any human standard. I don't even pass judgment on myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not prove that I am really innocent. The Lord is the one who passes judgment on me. So you should not pass judgment on anyone before the right time comes. Final judgment must wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the dark secrets and expose the hidden purposes of people's minds. And then all will receive from God the praise they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for reading that, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. So as Paul is um, continuing on and beginning in this verse, he's saying in that first verse, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And as Paul is um, given that theme of unification, how they could be unified in serving God and not divided as they were, um, you know, he's saying we should be regarded in two ways, servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God and not separated leaders, as was mentioned, you know, one was following Apollos and one was following Paul and, and someone else. So not following them as different leaders of a sect, but just as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And so that original word servant there, um, as I was looking it up and, and looking at this, I saw that it, it what the original Greek there is a rower, um, a crewman on a boat, almost like an under rower who mans the oars in the lower deck. So the figurative speech there is it's a subordinate executing officials, official orders operating under direct specific orders. And so we see that as being a servant, um, there's, you know, the picture of um, someone being under a boat, manning the oars, taking directors, taking direction from the one who's in charge. 
And we can see that that's how Paul said, this is how we should be regarded. We are under um, sub uh, submission to our father, God, our master, and we're taking direct orders from him as a servant and a leader in the church. And then we're also should be guarded stewards, a person who a steward is a person who carefully uses, controls, manages the possessions of another. So say, for instance, if someone said, you know, I need for you to um, take care of my house and watch my dog while I go on vacation. You know, you are at that time are being a steward of that person's house. You don't own it. You don't have any rights to it. All you're doing is taking care of whatever needs to be taken care of while that person is gone. And so that's why that's how Paul is given a picture of a steward in God's house. We don't own anything. God's word belongs to God. We serve under God, but we're taking care of his house until he returns. And so, but what we're being steward of is that mysteries of God. And so, you know, I, I don't, I didn't see it as a mystery as, you know, something that's, you don't know something until, well, a mystery meaning like you'll never know. It's a mystery to us, you know, we'll never know. But a mystery being it's God's word and he reveals it to us as we get to know him better. And as he reveals his word to us, it's no longer something that we don't know. It's something that God has, has given us through his spirit to know about him. And so our first point is, oops, I found my mouth. Servants are to be found faithful. And so that's what Paul is saying here um, in um, that second part of the second verse. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful, that they be found faithful. And so that's what Paul was alluding to as being a servant of Christ and being a steward of, of what God had given to them, entrusted them to take care of. He took, they entrusted him to take care of his word and of his people. And so um, as he gives a requirement, we are to be found faithful. Servants are to be found faithful because um, we are accountable to God. We are accountable to God. And so we are to be found faithful. And so um, any questions or thoughts um, about that as we uh, continue on or just any thoughts or questions? Well, so, this is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sister Cynthia. Yeah, Justice Kelly, I was reading in the NLT, um, the first verses in first five verses, and I see in verse four, um, or starting with verse three, he says, as for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. Uh, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. And so when I uh, reread that and, and was looking at that, it, it showed that even, even what we think of ourselves is not right, is not legit. Only God has the real real um the knowledge of us in our entirety so i can think i'm all that which god knows who i am and what i am or i can think i'm not capable or i'm not i'm not adequate enough or i'm not but god has the real story of of me you know and so so when that uh, i mean that touched me to say that i'm not even adequate i'm not even even able to really judge myself so I don't know if I'm looking at that incorrectly, but if I am, please enlighten me. Um, I saw it. I mean, yeah, I actually saw it as, um, you know, what he was saying was, you know, we have these roles in our lives and, and not just in the church, but different leadership positions. And, you know, not everyone will be satisfied with what the decisions are made or um, agree um, to the point of following along what, you know, the committee decision the committee makes or you know however it may be laid out but um it just says god paul's just saying you know i'm accountable to god so as god gives me direction and order to serve him and to tell others about the gospel that's who i'm serving and that's who i'm accountable to and although you may judge me for um you know 
judge me for how I preach or judge me for whom I'm speaking of about Christ, it's very small thing. It's, it's a small thing. It doesn't really matter because ultimately God is my judge. And so if I'm serving him um, according to how he's to be served and how he gives the order and the direction to be served, then that is whom I'm accountable to. And so um, that's how I saw it as well, Sister Cynthia. And all this, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it all. I mean, it's a point like Cynthia was saying that if Paul is kind of, you know, it's like saying, look, if uh, if I can't even adequately judge myself, then uh, how are you going to do it? You know, almost that case, right? How, how are you as this human authorities and others judging my ministry and what I'm preaching and all that? If I can't even almost assess myself, right? That ultimately, like you were saying, Kelly, that. God is the one that truly knows and he's the one who truly judges, right? So, yep. Okay, awesome, awesome, thank you. Any other thoughts? Awesome, yep, yeah, exactly. Not to judge past, not to pass judgment um, before the Lord comes. Like Paul was saying, you know, just you're doing it at the wrong time. Wait until he comes. Um, it's because he's ultimately going to be the one to judge and how you view our service to him. It doesn't really quite matter because God is ultimately judged. So, and when God comes, he's going to bring, as was mentioned in verse, uh, verse five, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart then each one will receive his condemnation um, from God. And so when God come, when when the Lord returns, he will bring to light what has been hidden and expose the motives. So if your motive of service is just to check the box, it will be exposed. Or if your motive to serve is truly in honor of God, you know, God will know. He knows all, whether which way the the seesaw goes, I guess, lack of a better word, but however. Um, your heart will be exposed either way. And so, you know, if you think about it for a second, what they did and the reason they did it for, you know, it will all be exposed because the truth, God knows the truth and it will be revealed. And if it's, if you're faithful to him, it'll show if you're, like I said, just doing it to check the box, it'll show God exposes the, the truth of, um, of your service to him. And so, you know, he's given us the measuring stick. He's given us his word as the standard. Um, it's being laid out. It's being, and that is what we use to apply as our service to him. And so um, it's it's his word. And that's how we're faithful in our leadership to him, using his word as our standard as, and as our measuring stick. So I had a question. So, so my question is, how do you measure people by your own personal preferences or prejudices. So like, let's say, you know, if you <clears throat> had a certain person that was coming into town to speak, you know, how do you measure them for your personal preferences? If do you say, you know, I, I don't really care for that person, you know, either, even if they were bringing uh, the word of God, is it, you know, would you go see them because you wouldn't care or would you still go see them because, you know, they had a good word and, you know, that they would speak the truth. So how do you measure your own personal preferences and prejudices? Hey, Kelly. Kelly? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, I think I base it on whether or not I so, first of all, it depends on the speaker, honestly, um, and on the situation. So, as an example, um, say for women's empowerment, uh, like, for instance, when I heard that they were going to have Viola Davis, I was really excited to hear her because I knew she had a positive message. But then when they came up with somebody else, um, and some of them I can't even remember, but it was like, nah, I'm not interested. Like Tyler Perry. Yeah, or even I think it was, I can't remember who they were, but yeah, you know, it's like, but I knew, but I, Viola popped in my mind because her message is so positive. <clears throat> so it depends on the person. It depends on the situation. Um, as far as if it were a church setting, there are certain um, 
ministers who have made a name for themselves that if if they were to come and not that they would come to Mount Zion, but if they were to come to Mount Zion, I wouldn't be there um, because of the because of things that I've learned about them or you know, and that that their message would not uh, even though they might have a message, I, I, didn't, I wouldn't want to necessarily support somebody who doesn't continually live or preach the word of God, if that makes sense. Yeah, I have one too, Kelly. Um, this is, this might be kind of weird and creepy, but um, like as far as like preaching and teaching, I measure people off Pastor Harris. <laughs> and I'm like, look now, I'm because I'm used to Pastor Harris just like giving so much scripture during a sermon. So like, if I'm listening to a, um, a, a sermon and there's not like a bunch of scripture, I'm like, oh shoot, like, is this more trendy? Or I, I think because like a lot of people, a lot of ministers today are leading, leading towards like the more trendy, trendy, um, you know, like eye catching, ear catching topics. And I'm like, dang, like, where's the scripture? I'm just like used to all that, all that scripture, you know, that pastor, that pastor Harris gives. So I tend to be kind of judgy when there's not a lot of scripture given during a sermon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Hey, so this, this was a little tricky for me. It's Tina. So I know my initial thought was, you know, when, when, you know, if you know, someone's speaking on that Sunday, you'd be like, Oh, I don't know if I'm gonna go that Sunday. I know people have thought that, mm -hmm. but more for the last few years, my thought has been, even if I don't necessarily like, or, or prefer, I'm not going to say like, or prefer someone's speaking or preaching style. My thought is, Lord, fix my heart on what the message is and what, what is it for me to take from it? Even if I don't really care for the preference or how they deliver it, usually there's something in there, um, especially when we're talking about the word of God. Now, I know Karen was talking about, you know, different types of speakers or what they bring. I, I'm just basing it off of just like speaking the word of God. I feel like if it's if it's real, there's something in there for us a take home. So instead of my personal preference, I would just I, I always say, Lord, what is in there for me to take home? Awesome. Thank you for for sharing. Yeah. And I I just think that if the word, if the speaker is speaking about God's word, it'll definitely show forth above the speaker. And so that's definitely how we, um, you know, use God's word as a measurement for service to him, you know, whatever that person might be doing a speaking or, or, you know, um, speaking mostly and teaching, but definitely using God's word about, um, you know, use as a measurement. And because I was, I was speaking of that question. I asked that question because, you know, that's what the people in Corinth were doing, they were using whom they thought was the better speaker and elevate in their teaching or, you know, and that's how the division in the church had, had, um, had, had started, had been going on. And that's what Paul was addressing about. Um, and so, you know, and it's a question that we can ask ourselves as well, you know, um, as servants in God's house and stewards of his word, have I been faithful of what he's called me to do? Am I using his word as a measuring stick and as a, um, a um, you know, a, a way to make sure that I'm in line with, with what his word is and what he has called me to do? So great comments. Thank you for sharing. Hey, hey Kelly, hey, yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Cynthia. Oh. Okay, uh, I like that question because it gives uh, us an opportunity to reflect. And I was thinking when you asked it that, you know, I'm at a point now that I don't care who's speaking. As you stated, as long as the word is the truth and they're speaking the truth. And so I was looking for the, the scripture that uh, kind of aligns with that. And I found it in first Philipp I mean, in first Philippians, I'm sorry, in Philippians, the first chapter in the 18th verse, and where it says, uh, but that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. And that was from Paul. And so that's that's the 
uh, position that I've taken, you know, it doesn't matter who's up there. It doesn't matter what I hear on the television or what I, if the word is being true, pe preach and it's true, I can listen to it. And whether they have a motive of just making money or whatever mm -hmm. reason. So that was I think Janae had something as well. Oh, yeah, I was just on the lines though, because it's kind of opposite of what Sister Cynthia was saying. I mean, so, you know, sometimes there, there are, just like, you know, the devil knew the word, but there are some, you know, what from my experience, where you have someone that's teaching sound doctrine, but just not walking the walk. And so the interactions, you know, based upon that, just like, you know, talking about church and, and pastors and things like that, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I feel like it has to be a balance of both, you know, um, because we do have, you know, a lot of <clears throat> teachers out there that know the word of God, like, you know, like the back of their hand, I, you know, cliche, but, um, you know, but then, you know, what is that lifestyle like? What is the interaction? So for me, it, it has to, you know, I'm looking at both both sides of it. Yeah, a couple. Thanks in the chat. Um, it says from Bowser, he says, I tend to seek thing, seek uh, like minded thinking, which is a good one. Um, Terrence put in there, um, I base mine on past interactions, conversations, um, et cetera, something like that. Um, and Brandy said, what you ingest affects you. If there were word or presences like swallowing glass, no matter the subject, I will not listen. We must protect our eyes and our ears. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you for all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking too, another thing too, because I put it on a level like outside the church. Uh, but if I'm thinking inside the church, and when I reread the question, because Jay had put it in the um, thing, what's your based on your personal preference? I, it brings back to memory how I've heard people say, oh, I don't like the way when when we have God fearing people who bring the word but they might not be as char charismatic or lively or whatever, but there, we have teaching ministers, we have, you know, shouting ministers, we, you know, everybody has their own style. And, and I continually tell people, so it's a certain person, some people that it doesn't matter the style, you may not like their style, but they've got a word in there for everybody. There's always a word for somebody. And so basically if, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I don't like the way that person preaches, but are you listening to what they're saying? Especially when I know that that person is a, is a man or woman of God and they are bringing the word. It's not how they're doing, it's are you listening to what they're saying? Exactly, exactly. Oh, I'll great back right off the of Karen. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, to piggyback right off of Karen, um, I mean, you look at the church today, Paul's addressing back then the same thing that we do today, uh, where we cause divisions within the church, and we don't think of them as divisions when we start putting our own personal preferences um, on the way that people preach. Um, like you said earlier, he addressed like some were going towards Paul, some were going towards Apollos, and some were going to Cephas, but they all had one purpose, which was to edify the church. They all were sent by God. With us, we bring our personal preferences in, um, and because we don't like the way, the style that this person preaches, or that some people dance, or that some people um, exhort, or some people correct, we start causing uh, divisions within the church. And it seems so subtle, but it's really a big thing. And this is what God doesn't want in the church. He, there should be unity within the church, not division within the church. And this is the same thing that Paul's addressing here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments and sharing. And so um, we'll go ahead and move on to the second uh, section in our passage of chapter four. So will somebody grab verses six through 13? It reads, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one, one against another. 
For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings and would that you would um, and would that you did reign so that we must share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. To the, to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse, the refuse, refuse of all things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Cynthia. So, so as we talked about that measuring stick, God's word being um, the standard as we serve him, as we um, minister and have our roles in the church, you know, Paul said, I've used this. He said, all right. Um, excuse me, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. So as that God's word is the standard for our service, you know, no one should be going outside of the, well, what he's saying is our service to God doesn't take us outside of the, the standard, the line. And so because that they were using these um, leaders in the church and elevating them and puffing them up, they were sh um, following over one above the other. And so, you know, they had their opinions and their ways that they were saying, you know, this person is a better speaker or, you know, this person, um, as, you know, talks about God, you know, however, the, the deciding factor of how they follow that person, they were really just puffing them up one above the other. But if we're using God's standard as the line for our service to him, then, you know, there isn't a sense of, um, you know, needing to go beyond what is written, needing to go, go beyond God's word. And so it gives, um, as we were talking, you know, we're placing, um, placing God's word over the word giver. And so when we go outside of that standard and that line and outside of God's word, it creates a self-righteous independence um, from the people that we're serving. And so be, and so Paul asks um, three questions in verse seven that says, I can't see, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And then if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So because of their um, pride, as Paul was pointing out here, they thought that they were different than anyone else. And Paul, different in regards to superior or um, some versions do say superior. But, you know, because of the leaders being elevated above God's word, they thought that they were, out, you know, they thought that they were above and superior than what Paul was um, given as a standard, which was God's word. And so um, for our first point for this section, servants are to display humility and servants are to display hum humility. And so what they have received from God was um, nothing to pride themselves over. So whatever they prided themselves highly of, it made them regard God, le regard God less. So however their pride, however, whatever pride that they had in them, as they saw themselves more superior than um, the other, one superior over the other, it showed that they didn't regard God at all. Um, you know, they saw that their pride made them above and beyond than the standard that God, that Paul had already given in the beginning, servants and stewards. And so in all things, God must be glorified over um, the leader. And Paul uses this sarcasm in verse eight 
um, to shed some light on their pride. Um, he says, you know, you have what you want, you've become rich, you know, without us, you've become kings, and with that, you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. Just a little sarcasm there that Paul uses, like, you're, ar you, you're already above and beyond. Um, and so, I, you know, how I just wish that I could be above and beyond with you, but I'm not. And because I'm not, um, the, the all the things that Paul mentions, Paul mentions underneath that verse shows that, you know, as we serve, uh, we, as we display humility, um, it's because we're called to endure suffering. And there's some things that Paul has mentioned in those next few verses that shows all the things that he had endured um, on display as men condemned to death, a spectacle to the world, um, fools for Christ, weak, dishonored, hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, brutally beaten, homeless, you know, working with your hands was seen as something demeaning back then as well, you know. Um, and so those were some of the things that he mentioned as as um as he you know was going through um, you know, him serving God and preaching the gospel and and telling others about Christ. But on the other hand, the people that were puffed up and prideful, they saw themselves as wise and strong and honorable, you know, superior than the standard. And so, you know, it's, it's very what what sticks out very interesting about the um, about the verse is, you know, in verse ten it talks about. I'm sorry, in verse nine, it talks about um, being a spectacle to the world. And so, back then, you know, in the Roman Colosseum, um, people were put on you know entertainment display to fight animals or each other. And so whoever won the battle that they had, they weren't just released and let go because, you know, if you won, you let go, you won the battle. But it was more like they fought and then they were fought again the next time until to death. And so that's the spectacle, you know, you, you're you're um, put on display and to the point of death. And so that was kind of um, what they did back then in the Roman Colosseum. And so it just gives a glimpse of how we're called to be humble and not above and puffed up um, above God's word because we will endure suffering. And, you know, and that's what Christ did. He endured the suffering of the cross to um, to give us a chance or a, a, a relationship with God um, through the eternal life. And so Paul just gives a glimpse of a problem and then examines it with the lens of the gospel. You know, we're called to um, endure as Christ endured. So any questions or thoughts? I know I just probably talked fairly fast. Uh, Jay told me to slow down. So I was trying to slow down a little bit, but slow me down. Somebody comment or or, or um, speak on what they see in the verse. Or I have a question as well, you know, if you see that you have gone outside of the standard of God's word, um, not just in leadership, but in anything, what pulls you back? What brings you back to, um, you know, the measure line? What pulls you back? What gives you that guardrail to say, hey, mm, no, I need to draw myself back and and use God's word as my standard for service? What What does that for you? I would say conviction, knowing that um, God expects this of me and I'm not living up to that standard. You know, I think what happens is when when God, you know, God expects something of, of me and I move from that personally, I fear that it will become more of a habit that continue down that same path. So I have to reel myself back in. So that conviction is important for me. Thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm sorry. I think sometimes exhaustion or um, energy levels is a high indicator too. Um, is that if we are not um, yielding our time over to God, 
Um, and if we're doing things to be doing things because we think that's what the Christian should do, um, oftentimes exhaustion leads us to um, leads us to that place of where we start searching the word more because we are we're wiped out. We're um, our reservoir has been tapped, so we tend to retreat more um, inward and um, look towards the word. Rest. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I ended it in my head, but I didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, Stacy put in the chat, mommy. So I see that as accountability, um, having others that are there to be accountable for you as well. I have a, um, a tendency to, you know, beat myself up sometimes when I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this or, oh, I should be doing something else. But I have to remember that, um, you know, it's it's just not to beat myself up and to to just ask God for, you know, forgiveness, definitely, because it's it's like in your heart, you you want to um you know, please him. And then when I do something, I'm like, oh gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I just feel like, okay, I, I feel like I know better. That's what I'm trying to say. I feel like I know better. I should know better. Um, but then that, you know, my flesh talks to me and, and tells me to move on. And then I'm like, oh no, no. So just asking God for forgiveness definitely is something that draws me back and not to put so much pressure on myself because I do that a lot. <laughs> so that's one of the things for me. So any other thoughts? All right, cool. We'll move on to our last section. So will somebody grab the last few verses, 14 through 21? This is the NLT version. I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. That is why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Some of you have become, some of you have become arrogant thinking, I will not visit you again, but I will come and soon, if the Lord lets me, and then I'll find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they have they really have God's power for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk it is living by God's power which do you choose should I come with a rod to punish you or should I come with love and a gentle spirit thank you sister Doreen all right so as we know Paul always well when you read some of his um, epistles, there is always some type of love that he shows that he has for the people that he serves. And so um, definitely is um, seen throughout this last few verses, especially in 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And so um, Paul displays his love that he has for the people that he's serving the Corinthian church, you know, he's given all of these um, things on, you know, in the above verses that we talked about, but then showing the love that he had for them so that they would know that, you know, Paul cared for them and he cared for them because, you know, God cares for us. So servants are, he set an example. Servants are to, for our next point, servants are to set an example. And so, in those verses, I saw that he corrected them in love and he displayed a fatherly love, um, a spiritual father as he was speaking of himself. You have many people that can teach you God's word, but 
um, you do not have many fathers. I become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, the spiritual father. Um, and then setting an example by following the greatest example in Christ, which is Christ. Um, and he also sent a reminder at, at, in Timothy, you know, in, in case you forgot, I'm sending Timothy, my beloved and faithful child, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And so um, what are some of the other ways that you see Paul showing an example of care and love um, in these verses? Well, for me personally, um, just these verses are just like jam packed with so much truth. But um, one thing that I see, um, as you have the point that servant set an example that's brought out there, uh, disciples to make disciples to be discipling. Um, that's why he says it's like imitate me, just like um, I imitate me as I imitate Christ, um, where he said later on. But uh, he said that uh, this is why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child. He was discipling Timothy um, in, in everything that he was doing in the way to follow Christ, in the example of Christ. He teach, he walked with him. He was intentional about uh, showing Timothy how to walk and how to follow Christ. And he's sending Timothy to reach the Corinthians as well. But he's also giving them an example like, hey, there should be unity. You guys are, have the one same father being that of now Christ. You're no longer exempt. You're no longer Gentiles. You are now just known as followers of Christ. So there should be unity. and You should be doing the same exact thing that I'm doing, which is proclaiming Christ and sharing him with others within the body, but also outside of the body as well. Thank you, Jay. And also, Sister Kelly, as he, he opens up in verse 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. So he's not writing to shame them. And he's not writing to, you know, come down forcefully on them, but he's writing to warn them. You know, as Jay said, be an imitator as I am, as I imitate Christ. So he's he's giving them examples and he's giving them the word, but he's he's not coming down so hard on them that, well, shall I say, he's not, he's doing it out of love. Mm -hmm. And even calling them his children, my beloved children. So there's a relationship, there's a connection. So he's just trying to get them to walk the right path. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Any other qualities seen that, that you see Paul displays? Um, hi, Kelly. Hey. Um, I agree with um, what was said previously um, about like just the protection and the nurturing that we've seen from Paul in verse 14. Um, but I also saw the part where he talked about him being their father in Christ Jesus. There was a level of responsibility, you know, he showed that like, you know, not. I think we talked about this in a, in a previous study about like, you, you know, we can um, be supportive of a person and helping, you know, guide them in Christ, but do you actually stick it out like that relationship? So I just saw that where he talked about him being a father um, to them in Christ Jesus. He showed that he was indebted to them, like he's not forsaken them. Um, he's with them. And then um, one of the other ones, I just found him to be a supportive leader because, you know, even though he wasn't with them, he they're still on his mind. He sent them help. You know, it kind of makes you think about how, um, you know, Jesus, when he says he's ascending back to the Father, he leaves the Holy Spirit with us as a God. I kind of saw that um, imagery um, when you think about Paul sending Timothy as their their point of support or help. I thought that was neat. Mm -hmm. And Bowser put in the chat the use of a rod. <laughs> Paul comes to them with either the use of a rod or with the gentleness of the spirit. He like gave them an option. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because that's definitely the segue for <laughs> for what Paul was going to talk about for for um, chapter five when we talk about that um, next week. But we're we're servants to set an example because we are responsible for the people and definitely as we were um you know speaking about that we everybody alluded to that you know the the taking care of and the nurturing like a father 
um, does a child, you know, a father wouldn't leave um, the child just, you know, they wouldn't forsake a child. And so definitely being there, maybe not physically able to see them, but at least sending Timothy along to remind them of the, their, their, will remind them of um, his way in Christ. So um, definitely Paul had shown that the example that he set and then because of the responsibility that God gave him, not just for um, the word, but also for God's people. And so, so that last, the last part that, that Bowser had um, was talking about, about the um, you know, coming with them with a gentle spirit or with the rod definitely is our segue into um, what Paul will be talking about with next week with the church discipline. And so um, it, that's perfectly leads into that. But, you know, the puffed up people um, that he had talked about in verse was verse 19, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills and I will find out not the talk of those Arican people, but their power. And just really just talking about, you know, are these people talking the talk and walking the walk? Are they displaying, um, are they displaying just all talk or are they actually um, uh, showing and displaying a life certain and serving God. So, you know, what he's saying is, you know, they can talk the talk, but is it really being displayed in their service? And so that's what, what Paul is saying, because God's word has the power to change, but is, are they, are they um, serving God or are they just talking about serving God? And so, there is no persuasive talk that can change people. Only God's power can. And so, you know, we talk, um, we can take all the things that we learned about Paul and his way of presenting himself as a leader and applying them, you know, to us as well. And so, um, you know, we are to be found faithful to God and um, accountable to serve him and humble and set an example in our service whether it's through leadership or through any other way that we serve God. And so I read this quote um, that I found when I was researching. It says, the work is not ours. We do not supply the materials. We are responsible to God. The day of the account is coming. Shall we meet him with joy or with grief? And so I, I thought about that, you know, as we were talking about, you know, we're, us being stewards of God's word and, what we're doing is taking care of his word and sharing um, his word and serving each other in our church body as a family being unified. And so God supplies his word. He supplies, um, he gives us the order and the direction. We're responsible and accountable to him. And so, and it will come one day when he, um, you know, um, when we meet him um, and, and, and so, you know, we, we, oh, every, I'm trying to think of two things at one time, <laughs> but, um, you know, a day will come, we'll, we'll be judged and, and we'll meet him. And so we want to hear the words, you know, well done, good and faithful servants. So um, any other thoughts or questions or comments or um, as we went through chapter four, anything else that stuck out that I had not mentioned or it just anything? Hey Kelly, okay. it's Janae. I was when I'm just taking it all in. I, I really come to the point in realizing that Paul was also being very obedient, um, which is a great thing because you you got to think and, and being obedient. And he was very you know boastful in saying this because you got to you know and thinking about when we're talking to others and being able to you know be very genuine and also truthful and uh, you know standing in front and just having those conversations. I'm you know, pretty sure that that's not the easiest thing to do, but I just, you know, just very, um, very excited how much of the obedience in this chapter as well as Paul displays. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts?
um, these are definitely not just, you know, the end all be all to um, the different characteristics um, that Paul, you know, that humbleness and the faithfulness and um, set an example, you know, these are just some of the characteristics that that I saw come out in this particular chapter, but definitely, as Janae mentioned, obedience is another one as well. So um, all of these things can be used toward um, serving God in our leadership roles and even just, you know, whichever uh, role God calls us in. And so um, any other different characteristics or qualities um, that anyone can think of towards serving God and, and um, just being unified as a, as a body, as a church body. But Sister Kelly, um, I was thinking about what Rashida said about Paul being a, a father to them. And I kind of got tickled in the NLT version at um, verse 18, if I can read. Verse 18, some of you have become arrogant, thinking I would not visit you again, but I will come and soon if the Lord lets me. And and when she said that, I thought about that's exactly as parents. You know, you think you're getting away with it, but I'll see you soon or I'll see, wait till we get home from church. <laughs> well, you know, you think you're getting away with it, but you're not. And so he was, he was, uh, uh, letting them know that when he visits, he's going to deal with it. He's going to hold them accountable as a parent would. And just as we are responsible for our brothers and sisters, we have to hold them accountable. He even, he mentioned some of you have become arrogant. You know, he's holding them account. He's, he's telling them, this is what I'm hearing, or this is what, you know, I'm going to deal with when I get there. And so it's just holding our brothers and sisters accountable. Mm -hmm. I like that, uh, Cynthia Brunt, about, about a parent, because a parent knows their children and know, you know, how to respond to certain ones and what they need, right? So, yeah, Paul is responding with some ex exhortation and encouragement, right, to, to a group of them. But then he's like, but some, yeah, like Cynthia says, some of you are ignorant, are arrogant, right? So, you know, my exhortation is probably going to fall on deaf ears with you. So just hold on, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, so she's she's exactly right that, that as a father, he knows kind of what that congregation needs, right? And especially dealing with the issue that he'll hit in chapter five, um, that he's he's got to come a little bit heavy because their arrogance has led them down a pretty bad path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a scary thought, you know, doing you think like, hold on, I'm coming, or wait till you know, your father or your mother gets home. It's just, I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, come on, just, just go on and beat me now. You know, <laughs> I don't want them to do what you to do because you might be a little bit more softer than, you know, the person that we might be waiting for to come home. So yeah, when you thought, when you said that, I'm thinking like, man, that's a, that's a scary thought. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Rashida, Kelly, I, I guess the, uh, no, I'm sorry. Knowledge is a, was, was the one when you asked the question about, uh, how have you seen yourself outside of God's standard? And I guess by the time I thought of the answer and, tans and typed it in, you moved on. But it, the, it's knowing, it's the knowledge of knowing what God's standard is um, that has pulled me back. Uh, how many of us are, you know, we don't know what we're doing. And the things you're talking about, like, how do we know, you know, the way that, that Paul is, is talking to these people, let him know he cares about it. It's a knowledge of the people. Uh, as the parent, you know, uh, you know what you're going to do, but as the child that we're talking about, an example y'all were given, what did I do now? I thought I did right. I thought they didn't catch me. <laughs> I didn't know they saw me. You know, something. I, so one of the knowledge is that knowing God's standard, uh, and you learn that through the what brings you back is learning it and the knowledge of it, and then and then applying it and having the faith. So the knowledge of it, and this is exhibited all through there. It's his knowledge of these folks, like you say, talking them sarcasm. You have to know people to be sarcastic with them because otherwise, you know, they just think you don't know what you're talking about. So it's the knowledge of the thing. And I put in there, you know, very few of us will get, will get caught speeding if we know what the speed limit is and we have the knowledge to know where the cop is. Okay. So when we're doing these kind of things uh, here, that's the most important. Or throughout the knowledge of a God standard and looking in the gospel to see it, getting the word and understanding how to implement it. 
-hmm. Thank you for sharing, Lou. Yeah, Rashida put in the chat, my mom used to say, we'll see if you're dancing by the same music when I get there. Mm -hmm. And then Brandy put uh, patience, grace, and compassion and kindness. It is what gives me the most comfort with my brothers and sisters, even at times when I forget myself, because I need them to remind me with all of those things in tow. And Marlene says, as Charlize says to her mom, you saw me with your back eyes. Mom said she had eyes in the back of her head. <laughs> I never did understand that one. <laughs> So oh, awesome, awesome. All right. Any other thoughts before we pray and close out? I didn't want to leave anybody out. All right. My screen went dark on me. Well, well, we'll go ahead and pray out then. And so, um, Jay, will you pray us out? Hearts and minds focus on Christ. Father God in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done um, on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, uh, as we continue on through the book of Corinthians, Father God, how it is so relevant for us today, um, how there was division within the church that Paul was addressing, um, that you were sovereignly still allowing, um, but still were in control of it, um, how we today as the church, this is still relevant to us today, um, as there is division in our church, Father God, and we are supposed to be unified because the church is your plan. Uh, we ask that you and your Holy Spirit just continue to dwell with us. I ask that uh, your Holy Spirit continue to open our eyes, open our hearts to one another, Father God, so that we can be uh, the good stewards that you called us to be, the good caretakers of the mysteries of you, that you, uh, through your love and kindness and through your grace and your mercy and through the work of your Son, have revealed to us um, through your Holy Spirit that salvation is now open to all, Father. Um, and that all we have to do is just trust and believe and place our confidence in you um, and the accomplished work that you have done, that you lived the life that we were supposed to live and died the death that we were condemned to die and that you are coming back uh, one day to redeem uh, those that you have called, Father God. So we ask that we just be good stewards of that message um, and just continue to share it with others. We continue to disciple it with others, give us boldness, give us strength uh, to not look to ourselves. Uh, but to only look to you to be good subjects and be good servants that you've called us to be, Father God. I ask that you convict our hearts when we uh, um, are all selfish and want to fulfill our own desires, Father God. But let us look more so to others and look to you, because that is the message of the gospel, that it is not about us, but it is all about you. So we thank you. We praise you. Uh, we ask that you just be glorified in all things and we be edified. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.